Hello and welcome to my discussion of Power Apps and Fusion development. My name is Phil Spokus. I'm the VP of Professional Services at Intellitect. I have a number of years of experience developing, delivering technical solutions to enterprises, companies, startups in a variety of verticals, including manufacturing, healthcare, and insurance. The goal of this session is to review the problem Power Apps is attempting to solve. We'll do a demo of Power Apps, introduce Power Apps. We'll discuss how to position Power Apps in your organization and how Power Apps can fuse development disciplines together and leverage your existing technical investments. So what's the problem? Satya Nadella, CEO of Microsoft, has said that he expects to see a shortage of around 1 million developers by 2030. That's a little shortage. The US Labor Department estimates that the global shortage of software developers may reach 85 million by 2030. That's a much bigger shortage. Regardless, most people agree there's a shortage. This is in spite of the fact that even today, Satya Nadella and AWS, or Amazon, excuse me, and others are announcing uh, some pullback of hiring. I think the long-term projections are still such that we expect to see uh, growth uh, in the industry and demands that exceed our supply for developers. We have a lot to do. We're more efficient, more effective than ever, but we still have large backlogs, long lead times, competing priorities focus in one area versus another. We have enterprise solutions that we've de developed or delivered um, in, that solve most of our problems, but not all of our problems, and getting specific features in are hard, even if we have uh, our own development staffs, harder when we're working with an enterprise vendor, let's say, to get these solutions in. There's a variety of ways to uh, to address this problem, many enterprise vendors out there have their own solution for extending or customizing their solutions. Uh, Microsoft's answer to this is Power Apps. Power Apps is a rapid app development platform. It's no code slash low, low code. So there's a little bit of code uh, that you put in, uh, similar to Excel functions um, within an app designer and app environment. Power Apps does replace InfoPath. If you're familiar with SharePoint development, InfoPath is the predecessor uh, form designer for your uh, enterprise solutions. Had reasonable success, uh, was a reasonable tool in its day, but its days are over. Power Apps is also part of the Power Platform, which includes Power Automate, which is used for workflow automation and replaces SharePoint workflows, as well as Power BI, which enables data analytics and reporting across your enterprise. It's a very powerful tool, Power BI, very mature these days, um, and a great tool for doing uh, data analytics, dashboards, reporting uh, solutions. So Power Apps is made up of a couple of different components. A uh, designer surface where we uh, add controls, <clears throat> add behaviors. Uh, behaviors are added through PowerFX, uh, which is a, a new language that uh, Microsoft has come up with, but it's really based on a couple of other uh, languages and development that Microsoft has done, both in Power BI as well as in Excel. There's also Dataverse, which is a cloud-based data model, uh, data service. Flows, which are Power Automate, uh, as well as connectors. Uh, custom connectors uh, are a key part of the fusion development model, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Power apps can be built uh, in a couple of different ways. Uh, there's Canvas apps, which give you a canvas, a blank canvas that you 
have complete control over via the UI and controls that are provided by Power Apps. Canvas apps can be embedded in Teams. There's also model-driven apps. These are dataverse driven or data model driven uh, applications. You have much less control over the behaviors. It's built in based on the data that you're, you're modeling as well as components that you add to your design surface. Microsoft Dynamics is built on model-driven apps. Its workspaces are built on model-driven apps. And lastly, Power App supports uh, pages, intranet or extranet websites. Each of these apps uh, should be focused on a particular feature or a particular function. Uh, you want to keep each of your Power Apps small and targeted and don't let them uh, grow too large. So portals, for example, you wouldn't replace all of SharePoint with a Power App portal. You might have a specific uh, feature that maybe power maybe uh, SharePoint doesn't go quite far enough for you or some other portal that you might have doesn't go quite far enough for you you can use power power apps and power pages to uh, build something that's quite powerful but should be focused on whatever that uh, particular feature is uh, the extranets are supported so we can make these public facing but they need to be, uh, they will be secured, they need to be secured, they have to be secured. And again, you're not going to replace your entire extranet. Rather, you might have a specific supplier portal or specific, specific supplier feature that you would uh, implement in Power App pages or Power App portals. In my demo scenario, I've created a simple SharePoint list called inventory-jjs. I added a few items to it. Item one, item two. If I take a look at one of these items, I can edit it. I uh, gave the item a name. I gave it a type. Is it a tool? Is it parts? Supplies? And I have some notes in here. So first test item. Because this is a list, by default I get attachments. So I can add attachments from my local drive uh, that are images, whatever they, they happen to be. And then I can save this. That's interesting and all. I can keep track of inventory items this way. But the form that I have is a default form provided by SharePoint. And we can probably do better. We're going to use Power Apps to do a little bit better. If I go to Power Apps on another tab here, I sign in and I see the uh, Power Apps uh, default service, surface area. With the surface area, <coughs> I'm given a home page, at which point I can quickly and easily create blank apps or automatically generate apps from a Dataverse table, a SharePoint list, an Excel file, a SQL table. I can even generate uh, apps automatically from an image or from a Figma designer. We're going to pick a blank app today just to uh, give you an idea of what it looks like to create an app from scratch. We're going to create a blank Canvas app and we're going to have it uh, by default formatted in phone. And we'll just create a, a brand new app here. What I'm going to be presented with is a, a blank canvas on which I can uh, start to build my app. I have a in the left here, I have a tree view of the screens and or components that are part of my uh, app by default, understandably, there isn't much here yet. I do have an app object which provide me some default values around the app and I have a screen. Before I go too much further, I want to connect uh, to my list. I'm going to say, hey, this is SharePoint. Uh, add that connection because uh, I have many different lists. Uh, across many different sites uh, in SharePoint. 
I'm going to paste in the location of that list, which happens to be my uh, personal OneDrive area of SharePoint. There's the list. I'm going to connect to it. Okay, great. So now I have this list connected. Now I want to use this list data. So to do that, I'm going to add a gallery control, built-in control in Power Apps. You can see that there's quite a number of them uh, for me to choose from. We'll pick a few today and you get the idea that, hey, I, I have lots of different things that I can, that I can add. Default, I get uh, some lorem ipsum data. I'm going to do a couple of things here. I'm going to tie the items for this gallery to my inventory data that I just added. And automatically, Power Apps and the gallery control investigated that data source and saw there's a couple of properties here. They look like defaults. The, there's a default title property on a SharePoint list control. I renamed it to item, but it's still detected under the covers. And it's uh, that title is automatically filled out for me in this grid panel. This grid is a collection of panels. That individual panel, I have ability to edit and control and add items, uh, add item properties from that particular item. You can see by default that item one was bound to the this item item. And this first test item was bound to this item dot notes. This item refers to the item that's in this panel. So uh, my editor uh, is allowing me to edit the first item in the control. The rest are there for display purposes. You see that there's also an image property here. So when we looked at our control at our list, we saw that there was a list of attachments. So that list of attachments is not represented, but I can represent it here. And I can say, hey, that image is going to be the first of this item dot attachments. So I'm going to display the first image. And I'm going to use the value property of the attachment. So this item is a table of attachments inside my individual item. So by default, my SharePoint list has this intelligent, uh, intelligent attachments list built into it. I didn't have to do anything other than create a SharePoint list. And voila, I can see images that I've attached to my inventory kind of silly items for inventory, but hey, whatever. So pretty quickly, I have a control. Uh, I have a list. I have it displayed here. I've already got additional features over and above what I see in my SharePoint list. I now get to see images, images on my list, and it's formatted for my phone. So right out of the gate, I'm doing good here. So that gallery control I'm going to rename to items gallery, my inventory items gallery. And okay, great, I've got a I've got a list, but let's go a little bit further. What if I want to see the details of that list? Uh, by default, I'm given a arrow, next arrow, uh, that naturally will will be used to drill into this individual item. So I have to, have to have some place to drill into. So what we're going to do here is we're going to add a screen. And I'm going to grab a template just to save a little bit of time. And we want a form. So we'll go ahead and grab a form template. And Power Apps uh, generated a screen for me that includes an edit form, uh, some labels. You see, as I click on the left, it's highlighting in my designer area the controls, I've got an accept icon, a cancel icon, and a rectangle to serve as the background for my title. In the form, this is an interesting control, it's blank. Uh, what am I gonna do with this? Well, let's 
uh, start to set some properties. The data source for my proper for my form is going to be my inventory data source. By default, it's going to be in edit mode. And then for my items, I want to have the items gallery dot selected. So you can see that I was able to navigate directly to the items gallery, even though it was on a different screen up on screen one. I just can refer to items gallery. That's because everything in Power Apps is global. Everything is a global variable. So beware. I then um, can go to properties, select edit fields, and I can add fields. Again, Power Apps knows that this is a SharePoint list and further it knows the shape of this SharePoint list and it's displaying to me all the properties that are in that list. I created that list, I just added a couple of things to it, but SharePoint gives me a bunch more stuff. What I want to see on this form is the item itself, what type of item it is, uh, and then let's take a look at the attachments as well. And let's go ahead and add those fields to this form. And very quickly, I have a form that is going to allow me to edit an individual item. And you can see it pre-filled for me already what I selected in the items gallery. So that's kind of nice. I mean, pretty quickly here, a couple of minutes, I've got uh, a list detail app taking shape. I do want to do a couple of things before I leave here on the cancel icon. What do I want to do? I know that I'm going to want to, when I select the X, I want to just go back. This is a PowerFX function that just navigates me to where I came from. And on the uh, check, you see that that template assumes, hey, I'm creating a form. So uh, you're going to want to submit this form, which saves the form. Again, another PowerFX function. And then what I want to do is navigate back to my list form from here. With semicolons, I can take that, uh, the unselect property and give it more functions. And these functions can get pretty complex. I've uh, written, we have written functions or written on uh, properties that uh, might be a page full of, of formulas. The formulas themselves can get fairly complex and then you can cascade them together, do if checks and cases and, and those sorts of things. You want to be careful with that and focus this to uh, an individual function, um, but be that as it may, you can go pretty crazy with uh, the forms that we have here. Now, so far I have no way to get to this screen. So if I go back to screen one and I select the, the uh, arrow, next arrow, I want to select the parent. So I click on that button, I select that item from the gallery, and then I get another uh, semicolon here, and I use the navigate method, uh, the navigate function, to navigate to screen two. Now, under normal circumstances, I highly recommend as you build these things out, you rename the defaults. Screen two should really be uh, item details screen, and screen one, screen one might be the items screen. You know, name these, these things so that you can easily navigate uh, to where you need to where you need to go. It's not just screen two; it's the items item screen. In the interest of time, we'll leave that alone. At this point, I've got a fairly decent app going here. I've got a list of items, um, and I can navigate uh, to an item. I can make some changes. Um, for example, I can attach a file. Now let's grab another another GIF. Uh, let's say awkward interviews um, PNG. It doesn't really matter what this is. Obviously, I can hit select. I can navigate to item two. That's the birthday GIF. I can navigate back to item one, and I see yes, I still have my customer service 
uh, customer service, Jeff. It's not displayed on the, on the uh, home screen because uh, it's customer service. Interestingly, uh, I can pretty quickly add a ad, uh, ad as well. So let's just try and give that a shot. So let's go add a icon and I know it's the ad. Uh, add icon and so for on select on the add icon what I'm going to do is I'm going to say um, I'm going to say that I want my edit form one I want a new form Edit form one, and I want to navigate to screen two. This is not going to do what I expect. I'm going to try this out. I hit the plus screen. Testing it. What kind of a type is it? It's parts. Um, I attach a file. I save this. Guess what? I've got a, another item. Yeah, that's a little wigginess with that showing up, but again, the, your, your development environment here is dynamic, always live. Uh, at some degree, you know, the some of the data connections are live. Your app isn't necessarily running, but the connections are live, and the the app is operating even as you're building it. Uh, you can then get some of the behaviors just by holding down the print screen, the holding down the Alt button, and it'll actually do do what you want. So that was pretty cool. Uh, in a couple of minutes, I've got uh, a list displayed. I can navigate into an individual item, display it, and I can create a new item. A couple of minutes, I've got a reasonable app. Now, you know, that's simple, easy, might be useful. Um, this will display on my phone, on a tablet. I can walk around <coughs> checking inventory items, for example. But let's say when I'm adding inventory, I also want to take pictures. I could do something like uh, add a control which is media or a camera object. I can drop this on here and this will resolve. See my uh, lovely face uh, in my home office here uh, ready to take a picture for me. Now I have to add uh, quite a bit more functionality, not quite a bit, a little bit more functionality here to actually get this camera control to work. But I do have samples and we've actually implemented apps for customers where, hey, they're taking uh, pictures of parts or pictures of whatever and attaching them to, uh, it, to a SharePoint list item. Uh, could also be added to something else. You can upload the images to Azure Storage. There's a lot you can do with these images. Uh, a lot you can do with the controls and there's quite a number of controls that are provided out of the gate. Again, today's session wasn't intended to be a training session, just an intro, give you an idea of the capabilities of Power App. Cool. So one of the things we looked at during that presentation was PowerFX. We saw the first method. You can also do things like count rows. There's many functions that are available by default. So PowerFX is that language that you use to add behaviors. It's general purpose, you can do lots of different things. It's strongly typed. Uh, you notice that we got IntelliSense. It knew what the type was that I was typing in. It's also fussy about matching up types. If a particular item property wants a string, you're going to have to make sure that you provide a string. There is some coalescing of types that's done. 
But uh, one thing to watch out for are tables versus lists versus strings. If uh, you are returning a table value, sometimes you'll you'll need to manipulate that that table value to get what you want. Power, power Automate flows. This is if my app, for example, I verify an inventory item or I want to add a new inventory item I was able to add there, but I want to make sure that the organization knows or maybe I get approval that when I add an inventory item that's a, that it's actually a legitimate item. I have to go through uh, an approval process. That would be implemented in a Power Automate flow. I can hook that flow either to a button that's in my app, or I could hook it to the actual save or the submit form. I submitted, I successfully submitted, okay, trigger a flow that's going to go validate that, that that's a legitimate item that I added. And then Dataverse is another key component. Uh, Dataverse is this cloud, is a cloud hosted by Microsoft 365 data store. Uh, it also manages uh, connections, uh, what connections are available, and that, uh, uh, as well as providing access to Dynamics data if for the Dataverse that's in the Dynamics environment. You get a default set of tables, and then you can also add tables. You can add columns to existing tables uh, as well. So you get some of the some of the uh, classic uh, access app type functionality though this is a single dataverse instance you can create multiple dataverses in multiple different environments connectors and is that the other key component it's really the foundation of tying uh, the power app to custom apps or to your enterprise apps uh, as well as tying to Office 365 or Microsoft 365. So I connected to a SharePoint list. I can also trigger emails directly from within Power Apps. I can talk to OneDrive documents, uh, look up AD users or groups uh, or teams. Some common third-party connectors include SAP, ServiceNow, Google, and a host of others. We can also create custom connectors. And in my next demo, we'll uh, review a simple custom connector to add inventory locations into our fledgling uh, inventory app. So Power App custom connectors, connections. You have a Power App, you have a connection, which uh, is your intro to a connector. The connection itself has credentials associated with it. The custom connector is based on open API specification uh, that's made available. And then that custom connector actually does the work of calling your service. Could be an Azure app service, could be anywhere. Anywhere that that service is available from your environment, you can call out to it. Fusion development is Microsoft's term for taking that custom connector and working with the rest of your team to build apps. This is really the way we like to do development anyway, making sure that we're working with a subject matter expert or you know the person who's concerned about inventory in this case, uh, IT systems manager who is gonna be dealing with provisioning and securely provisioning our apps. Uh, a full stack dev or API developer, the pro dev who's building this custom uh, application, and then citizen developers, which may be um, technically oriented or those on the staff that are inclined to build something like a Power App. That Power App developer could be a pro dev as well, uh, using a quick, easy you know solution. Maybe it's a temporary solution or short term short term solution might be a pro dev that takes that on, could be somebody else on the team. Uh, the key thing is that all of these disciplines are bought, brought together into a single team. Even if there wasn't uh, Power App devs, we would do this, right? We'd wanna make sure that there's a product owner, that there's a subject matter expert, that we have the support of systems admin from a dev, uh, dev, uh, DevOps perspective, as well as our development team that's building out custom applications. Uh, for an organization. 
Uh, next, I'll do a quick demo of connecting to a simple inventory locations API. I'm now going to demonstrate adding a custom connector to Power Apps. I'm going to add this to my existing demo. And what I'm going to add is a simple API call to an inventory management service that I've deployed into Azure. I've wrapped that inventory management service with API management from Azure. API management uh, allows me to filter or control what APIs I make available. Uh, it also redirects my API calls. Uh, say today I'm deploying an app service, tomorrow I might be deploying in Kubernetes. Uh, API management uh, allows me to manage that independently. So my inventory management API just has a simple call to get API, uh, to get warehouse locations. I'm going to go ahead and test this using the test pane of API management. I select the that API on the test pane. This is just going to do a, a simple get call and it's going to return a city name for my inventory locations in a collection. Great. Another benefit of API management is there's a built-in create power connector function. So I can select an API inventory management. I can select a target environment where this connector is going to be created. So in my scenario, my tenant, I have a default, I have a CRM environment that was created when I installed Dynamics, and I have a dev environment that I'm using as my development workspace. I'm not going to create, uh, this takes a, little, a few, minute, few minutes and I've already done this in my environment. So we're just going to skip ahead to that portion of the demo. If I go to my data, I can add data and I see connectors. So I see the connector that I've added as well as a bunch of other connectors. Office 365 users, which I've used recently, SharePoint, SQL Server, etc. Now many other connectors that I can add. I'm going to go ahead and select Inventory Manager to add that connection. Now I want to place the display my data. I'm going to go ahead and add a new screen for this data. On this screen, I'm going to add a button to call my API. When that button is selected, I'm going to collect into a locations collection the results of the inventory management get API warehouse locations endpoint. Collections and this locations collection is an important uh, concept in this scenario because this caches my call and allows me to control when that API call is going to be made. Power Apps is a dynamic environment. If I just bound that inventory management result to a, a grid directly, for example, I may easily generate numbers of API calls back to my, my API. And I don't want to do that. I want to control when my API gets called. So I put it on a button. Obviously, the this function could be put in a number of other properties in my in my app. I'm also going to add a vertical gallery to display the results. And the advanced tab here, I'm going to go to my items and I'm going to say we're going to use the locations collection. Now right now I don't see much, but I can run this form, select button, and we see that, hey, I've got inventory locations that got displayed in my gallery. We can see, again, that connector knows what the API is, knows what the shape of that API is via the open API spec, and knows that there's a city name property. So it fills it in by default for the title of my item pane. 
Uh, it also uses city name that happens to be the only uh, field in the result, uh, but it uses that for the subject. But if I don't want the subject, I could easily, uh, easily delete that and everybody would be happy. So this is a quick demonstration on adding uh, custom data into my Power App via a custom connection. So to review what we did there, we have an existing web application, services uh, in the middle, data stores, data sources, that's being deployed into an app service, could be Kubernetes, could be AWS uh, services, doesn't really matter. I implemented API management to expose that API to my connector, which I then wired up to Power Apps. So the bit on the Power Apps end is pretty easy with regards to the, to the application. You have an application you're already developing, or if it's an enterprise app that you've deployed, if there's an API there, you can uh, generate an open API spec and create a custom connector to extend that application with Power Apps. Real world examples, uh, we've got a number of them. They include uh, a non-conformance report for a manufacturing customer where with a mobile device, they can go take pictures of non-conforming material, add a few pieces of information, submit that non-conforming material for disposition, which uh, kicks off a workflow, getting people to review the non-conformance. Can we fix it? Do we have to return it? Et cetera, et cetera. So it's a nice uh, mix of something that uh, uh, that they need to do. It's a specific non-conformance uh, reporting. It doesn't take care of all of inventory or anything else, just a specific function. And it's very easy for them to use, use saves them a, a bunch of time and actually re replaces a legacy SharePoint uh, info path and uh, workflow, SharePoint workflow that was legacy and not worth maintaining anymore. And we have a number of, number of other examples. Uh, as well. Beware, uh, you know, no, uh, everything isn't all uh, kittens and rainbows. There are dragons uh, that lurk among uh, Power Apps. Uh, Power Apps is maturing uh, somewhat rapidly. Uh, new features and cleanups and refinements are coming all the time. But there's a few truis truisms that dictate where Power Apps are really going to fit for you. Everything is global. So you really have to think about the, the fact that the size of an application can really be sort of what you can fit in your brain at any one time. And most of us can only you know do a couple of things at once, uh, the, whether we like to admit it or not. So you wanna keep your power apps focused on a specific function. There are variables and different ways that you can sort of game the system, but you probably don't need them. I used a collection variable in the, in the prior example that seems to be the one that gets used more, most often. If you find you're needing a lot of variables, uh, maybe take a step back, uh, pause for a minute and determine, should this really be a power app? Or if you think your, your app needs to get really big, stop for a minute and think, you know, is power apps really the, the right approach? Uh, maybe you go back to the full dev team and you know, wait in line for, for, your, for the functionality. There's some fidgety bits with the UI layout, especially if you have a lot of forms, getting things to sequence or resequence and layout correctly on a form can be a little bit of a challenge. It's not too bad, but it, it's, it's not awesome. Um, changing parameters to Power Automate, you're gonna pass some parameters in. If you change them, that can get a little wonky. Uh, responsive is supported, uh, but it's also a little tricky. Uh, a little too tricky, uh, you know, it can be done. You just have to be careful how you do it. And if you have a lot of controls that you're trying to, to keep responsive, again, that layout can be, can be uh, a little challenging. There's an emerging ALM story. Uh, I deployed into a dev environment. I could create a, qua, uh, a QA environment for quality control, a review, for example, and you saw my default production environment as well. So with the uh, ALM support or application lifecycle management support, I can automate uh, or drive when I go from dev 
uh, deploy into QA and can deploy into production. And that environment can include your workflows as well as your apps, as well as uh, connections, as well as other artifacts that might go along for the ride for your solution. So there's this way to package and then deploy. The Power App code, as it were, those forms can all be extracted into YAML, that YAML can be edited and then re-returned and redeployed um, into Power Apps. You don't have to use the designer. Uh, there's rare cases where you're going to probably want to use the YAML source. It's nice to know, nice to know that it's there. It's also uh, nice that you can, independent of Office 365, you can store your uh, source, as it were, off into uh, Git, for example, source code control. Note also the custom connectors, uh, what I just showed, require premium licensing plans. That means uh, either per seat or consumption or potentially other other options. There's uh, you know, enterprise enterprise licenses. Per seat means that I have to have a Power Apps license to use that uh, connector. Consumption means that I can provision this and I'm going to get charged extra based on how often that that app is going to be used. That may work for you. So some references to, to sort of wrap things up. Uh, there's a lot of information available online, Microsoft Learn. There's a few things that I think are, are probably most interesting for today's session. That includes a page of case studies that cover a lot of the different scenarios. It's a great place to go to get ideas for how Power Apps can be used. Uh, transform your info path form is sort of a step-by-step -step or insight from Microsoft into how you go from info path to Power Apps. Uh, Power Apps form Power FX formula reference is a nice thing to look at to get an idea of the scope of what's in, uh, included in Power FX. And then connect a reference. What, uh, what's out there? What's available to me off the shelf from third parties without me having to build it uh, is uh, uh, available in the connector reference. And again, there's general, uh, general uh, purpose training on how to do Power Apps um, widely available as well as from Microsoft. There's a couple of YouTube uh, channels that, that are, are kind of good. They're easy to find. And there's uh, a vibrant community of devs, uh, Power App devs as well. So in summary, we reviewed why Power Apps, why is this a thing? Uh, hopefully with the discussion and some of the demos, you get an idea of some of the power of Power Apps. Uh, we introduced Power Apps, some of the key concepts, not all the concepts. There's a lot more than, than what I covered today, obviously. And then we discussed a bit how to position Power Apps in your enterprise. How can you use it? What, what are good ways to use it? Uh, thanks very much for coming and reach out. Uh, we'd love to discuss uh, how you might be able to use Power Apps, how we can you know, do uh, Power App development plus custom development, augment enterprise solutions, augment your uh, uh, existing custom development that we're doing for you or that you're doing for yourselves. Thank you very much.